thank y'all for being here. If you want lunch, the kids have it back there. So, as we have gone through this series, uh, we've done the chronological portion of it. We've started hitting topical things, so now we are getting to another portion of the topical studies, and that is basically communities. So we're going to start today with Live Oak, and then we're going to hit Bramford next month, and et cetera, et cetera, just some of the existing communities to, to talk a little bit more about them, a little bit of focus just on them. So any questions, thoughts, or comments before we start? All right, so early history of Live Oak and the area around Live Oak. We've got lots of different things. Native Americans, and we're not going to. We, we've spent time talking about these already. A lot of this stuff, so I'm not going to delve into too much details. Just kind of a refresher, a reminder, and just to let you know that it focused here in Live Oak also. So we've got lots of early history of the Native Americans, uh, people like the Wheaton Island culture that was here uh, between 200 and 750 A.D or up to 900 AD, depending on some of the folks. Uh, we've got um, lots of other ones like that. Uh, these are not actually from Suwannee County or from Live Oak. They're from some of the neighboring counties, but these are representative of what the Wheaton Island culture had here around Live Oak. By the time early Europeans arrived in the 1500s, we've got the Tamuqua. They kind of came to be in power here and they, they ranged from the Ocala area, uh, more or less down there, all the way up into uh, the Altamaha River Basin. So North Florida, South Georgia, that area was where the Tamuqua lived. And we've talked about these folks before also. Uh, so we know more about them than some of those previous cultures, like the Wheaton Island culture, uh, because Europeans wrote about them. Native Americans didn't have their own uh, writing, really but the Europeans wrote about them. So we know a lot more about this culture, even though it no longer exists. We know a lot more about it because the Europeans wrote about them. So uh, we've got, they were a very fierce, warlike tribe. They liked to tattoo themselves. We've talked about it before, uh, where basically you did something good, something great. Perhaps you killed an animal or killed a, another warrior. You would get tattoos. So the older you got, the more tattoos you would have. Uh, they also were pretty tall compared to the Europeans. So that's something that was noted by the Europeans when they wrote about it. Because the Europeans back then were, you know, five foot, five foot, five, somewhere around there. But the Eastern Mooka were six foot tall, a lot of them. And so they towered over the Europeans. Plus, you notice over the left, they had the hairdo. They, they kind of pulled it up into a, whatever you want to call it. So they appeared even taller than what they really were. So this, this culture not only hunted, only fished, but they also farmed. They were a pretty, of the cultures, and when you look at different kinds of Native American cultures, you've got kind of the epitome, you've got the ones like the Mississippian culture, and then later on things like the Aztecs, the, the Mayans, the Incas. This group, the Tamuqua, were a step below that. So they lived in communities, they lived in villages, they did farming along with the hunting and the fishing and things like that, uh, barbecue. Some people think we get the word barbecue from the barbacoa, uh, which was the Spanish word that they used to describe with Tamuqua and some of the others in this region between Florida and the Caribbean, how they would cook their food. So barbecue, think of barbecue this year, this summer. You can think of the Tamuqua and others that did that way before us. Um, but anyway, so that was Tamuqua. And uh, unfortunately, because of disease from the Europeans, because of warfare, uh, the Tamuqua basically died off. The last known Tamuqua that we know of died in 1767. He had left Florida when Spain uh, lost Florida to Great Britain after the end of the French and Indian War, the Seven Years' War. Uh, he went over to Cuba, and that's where he died in 1767. So that culture is gone. So in the meantime, while they're still here, we have the first Europeans arriving here in what's now Suwannee County including Hernando de Soto here in 1539. Uh, he landed in Tampa Bay, traveled northward, encountering the, the different uh, villages along the way. So he encountered the Tamuqua here uh, in September, August, September of 1539. Um, this journey between he and his basically 600 men lasted for several years, basically four years, 4,000 miles of the American Southeast. 
and the South. They traveled all throughout it. Uh, although DeSoto himself died in 1542, close to the Mississippi River, most of his men did survive, and some women did survive to get back to, to Mexico eventually. But when they came through what's now Suwannee County, they arrived in, uh, <clears throat> see right here, Suwannee County. This is pretty much where they traveled in those four years uh, of travel. But you can see they came right through Suwannee County. And uh, they stopped at a village called Napatuka, which was probably very close to Live Oak, maybe just east of Live Oak. We're not exactly sure, but it was somewhere close to Live Oak, it looks like. Uh, they also stayed at a place called Many Waters or Muchas Aguas, uh, somewhere in that region just before that. Uh, again, probably in Suwannee County. And they went to this place called Napatuka. And one of the chroniclers, there were uh, four guys ultimately after the DeSoto expedition that wrote about it. And so that's why they have a lot of knowledge of that. One of those chroniclers uh, wrote about Napatuka being a very beautiful village with plenty of food, and there was a plain, a large plain nearby. So I like to think of it as perhaps the Gum Slough area just uh, east of Live Oak, uh, close to where the Boys Ranch Opportunity Store is, somewhere in that area. When you're going on 90, look to the right, you've got that huge uh, plain there with some uh, hills just to the south of it. So I'm not sure that's it or not, but. That's kind of what I picture whenever I'm picturing a, a beautiful village place with, a, uh, with lakes nearby and with a, a plains nearby. But regardless of exactly where in Swanee County it was, uh, when they came there, uh, we have the issue of DeSoto. And again, we've talked about a lot of this in more detail. But DeSoto was not the friendliest to the Native Americans. He would end up capturing chiefs, usually, if he could, to be able to, to barter for their freedom in exchange for that, uh, being allowed to get through there without being attacked. Well, he had captured a major chief, or, or a cacique, as they were called by the Spanish sometimes. Uh, he had captured one called Aguacaliquan, who lived probably around what's now the Chutney Springs. And he was pretty much the governor, if you will, of this area. So not only was he a village chief, he was the regional governor. And so a lot of the villages around did not like that DeSoto had captured him. So eventually they decided to, to masquerade as friendly to DeSoto, but in the meantime, gather up thousands of warriors and attack DeSoto and his men. Well, DeSoto found out about it through some of his captive Native Americans, and he was ready for them when they attacked. So this battle became uh, called Battle of Napatuka, Battle of Two Lakes, Battle of Two Ponds, and it basically resulted in a, a routing of the Native Americans, and... <clears throat> Overnight, hundreds of them were captured, including several of the village chiefs, and DeSoto tried to make nice with them and tried to let them go, but they weren't having it, they were fighting, so basically he just wiped out all the men, all the chiefs, all the adult men. He kept the women and the children as slaves and consorts for his men, and then they continued marching onward to the west. This is not the Spanish. This is a drawing of the French on the left uh, attacking one of the coastal Native American groups. But same era, same kind of weapons being used. <clears throat> now part of the reason we don't know where Napatuka exactly was located was because of the Native Americans, the Tamuqua, believed the site was haunted, it was evil, and they left the corpses to rot, they burned the village down, and they never returned. So. We just don't know exactly where it was, but it looks like it was somewhere close to Live Oak and probably at least in Suwannee County. So moving ahead, the Tamuqua have now, by 1767, the Tamuqua have died off or left Suwannee County. <coughs> and we've got Spain that is ruling the territory until the end of the French and Indian War or the Seven Years' War because it lasted how many years? Seven years. So that ends in 1763. And um, Great Britain gets it from 1763 to 1783 when the American Revolution and the other wars related to that uh, get done. But meanwhile, you've got another group of Native Americans moving here into Suwannee County, a hodgepodge of groups uh, like the Lower and Upper Creek, the Yamasee, uh, runaway 
slaves, and they kind of uh, conglomerate into what is called the Cimarron, which means runaways in Spanish, but they come to be called the Seminoles. And so they have moved in here, and they live here by the late 1700s and uh, have many villages, not just in Suwannee County, but North, uh, North Florida and the surrounding areas. So this guy is Osceola. He was not a chief. A lot of people call him Chief Osceola, but he was never a chief. He was a war leader, if you will. Uh, but he's probably the most famous Seminole. Uh, but he lived in North Florida, pretty much. Not here in Suwannee County. So after the uh, Seminoles were kicked out, we had a few wars, the first and second Seminole Wars that were fought up in North Florida. Uh, we had a couple of wars that were fought there in the 18-teens and the 1830s up through the early 1840s. So the Seminole Indians were pushed out of this area and sent to either Oklahoma, or what we would become Oklahoma, and also South Florida because nobody would ever want to live there but the Seminoles. But after that point, we've got a lot of Americans moving in to this region. And so by 1858, December 21st specifically, my wife's birthday, they have enough population here to create Suwannee County. So this is chapter 895 of the Florida Acts. That's an act to create and to organize the counties of Suwannee and New River. You all obviously have heard of Suwannee. How many of you know about New River County? If you all been here long enough, you've probably heard me talk about it. New River County was renamed just a few years later after the first officer from Florida killed in the Civil War. His name was Bradford. So Bradford County was originally New River County. So when you go over to Bradford County, you will cross over, like when I drive like a 100, uh, going from Columbia County into Bradford County, you will cross over the New River. And that's where the, the name of the original name came from, was the New River. But anyway, so we've got the boundaries here uh, of Suwannee County, which were adjusted slightly in years later, about uh, three or four decades later, they adjusted it just slightly. Uh, but Swanee County was created. Live Oak was not the county seat. If you read through this, and it's probably on page two that I don't have on here, you will find that the original county seat was the house of William Hines. William Hines was a judge in this area. And from what I have found from our existing records, the property he owned was just off Nobles Ferry Road, close to where it goes over I-10. Uh, so that's the region we know of that he owned property. So it's possible that's where the first county seat was. Now very quickly thereafter, it was moved to Houston, which is where it was for the next 10 years. So focusing on Live Oak, Founding of Live Oak itself. Live Oak did not exist apparently when Suwannee County was created. There's no records of it anyway. There are some sources that say it was established in 1858 or 1859. Um, and that may be true. The earliest record I have found of Live Oak was from, I believe, April or May of 1861, which is right here. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. But Live Oak was named, whatever year it was established, it was named for a huge live oak tree, such as the one on the left. Uh, that live oak tree was located um, just north of Highway 90, just south of Duval Street, just by the railroad there where uh, Scriven Street is, which is one block basically west of Houston Street. So um, if you know where that area is, you know basically where that live oak tree was. Now there is a retention pond there now. It's pretty easy to figure out based on where the retention pond is, just north of the railroad tracks. So what happened was um, people would travel from Georgia, South Georgia especially, down to the coast, Steenhatchee area, and they would stop at this live oak tree because there was a large pond next to it. So they would stop there, they would rest under the tree, they would eat, their, their horses could use the water from the pond, and so they would travel, so they would, they would stop at the live oak. Well, when a railroad was uh, agreed to be built, starting in 1857, uh, that's when the construction started between Tallahassee 
and Jacksonville. There were two different railroads that were building together uh, to come together in what's now Lake City. Uh, well, as the railroad workers were working, they would stop at that live oak tree. They would take their breaks. They would eat. And so they, would, they kept saying, we're going to go down to the live oak. So eventually they called a station there, Live Oak Station. So the first time we find it mentioned, 1861, it's Live Oak Station. It's just a station on the Pensacola and Georgia Railroad. So again, could have been 1858, 1859, but it was here, Live Oak was here by 1861. Um, so this is a portion of an annual report from 1861, and this is where it's first talking about, that I found anyway, talking about the establishment of the connection between Station 12, which was Lawton, Georgia, and then Live Oak Station on Pensacola, Georgia. So that connection line between the Pensacola and Georgia Railroad here and the one in Georgia, the Atlantic and Gulf, that would connect Florida and Georgia uh, was a big deal. And we have talked about that in some detail in previous presentations. Now, who named it Live Oak? We don't know for sure. There are some indications that this gentleman here, William H. Rousseau, who had been here for about 25 years or so by then, uh, one of our early settlers, that perhaps he named it Live Oak. He lived in the Swanee Springs area at one point. Uh, the first Masonic Lodge in Swanee County was established by him, uh, but he was the first station agent, railroad station agent in this area, so there's a good chance he named it Live Oak Station. A lot of history about him. He actually was a state senator for this area during the Civil War. After the war ended, he was in bad health, so he was suggested by his doctors to, to move down to Central Florida. So he actually moved there, but he died a couple years later in Clearwater. So that's where he's buried down in that area. There's a Russo Cemetery even today. But, but there's a good chance this man here is the man that named the Live Oak. So that connection I was talking about. By April and May of 1861, the Civil War has begun, and the Confederate government realized there was no railroad connection between Georgia and the rest of the Confederacy and Florida. Florida was the Confederacy's newest state. It was the least populated state of the Confederacy. But we had something that a lot of the other states didn't have ready access to, and that was lots of food. Cattle, things like that, beef, uh, hogs, whatnot, corn. And plus, we were kind of a backwaters area. And so other than places like Jacksonville, Cedar Key down here, uh, Fernandina, Pensacola off to the left, uh, Key West, Tampa, uh, pretty much outside of those coastal areas, Union forces did not come in into the interior. And so this area of where we live and, and down throughout the peninsula was pretty free of Union forces, so that allowed the citizens to keep producing their goods, their, their food and whatnot uh, that they were able to produce. And so the Confederacy said, we've got to get access to that, to the rest of the Confederacy, to where the major armies are, and so this was already in the works, this connection line, but the Civil War sped it up. And so they agreed to go from Live Oak to Lawton, Georgia, uh, and that connection line was supposed to be ready by early 1862. It was not. There were a lot of issues going on. Uh, one of the major issues was we've got it graded, but we don't have the iron ties to do it. South didn't have a lot of manufacturing capability, and so they had to look elsewhere. Well, what they decided to do was, let's tear up this Florida Railway because its junction points were up in Fernandina and then down to Cedar Key. Both of those places had been captured by Union forces. And so the, federal go the, the Confederate government said, let's just rip up all the ties here and move them over here because this is much more important. Well, um, the major owner of the Florida Railroad right here was a guy named David Levy Uly. He was, had been a state senator before the, the war. He was, a, he was a big deal in government and business. And he said, no, you cannot have my, my railroad ties, my railroad irons. 
And so this was like a three-year court battle, back and forth. There's lots of, you can spend lots of time looking at it and researching it. But Governor Milton of Florida was trying to tell Uly, give it up for the good of Confederacy, and he just didn't want to do it. Eventually, they ripped him up anyway and moved him to this connection line. But it was not put in service until April or March of 1865. The Civil War basically ended a month or two later with, with Lee's surrender. I mean, there were, there were other units that survived longer, but basically the Civil War was over by the time that connection was finished. Well, ultimately, Uly wins his battle against Florida. Governor Milton's committed suicide by this point because the war was, was lost. Uh, but he's able to have these railroad ties, iron railroad ties, removed from this railroad and put back on his useless railroad at this point. It never goes back in service, but he's proved his point. He's gotten his money back, that kind of stuff. And so uh, Pensacola and Georgia, which, which owns this portion of the railroad and this part here, um, is having to buy new railroad ties to reinstall on this line because this is still the only line into Florida right after the Civil War. But they do it very quickly. And it's back in operation. And that's good because there are a lot of people from the north moving to the south. And if you want to come into Florida and you want to come by railroad, you got to go through Live Oak. And so that helps Live Oak to grow immensely. And that railroad line by 1882 extends down through Branford and beyond. So, so as the post-Civil War era grows, uh, population-wise, Live Oak is growing especially, and the railroad connections are growing. But I'm going to hold up on that before we move on to that. Going back to the Civil War, lots of things going on with Suwannee County, but I want to focus on this guy here, Lewis, excuse me, Lewis Thornton Powell. Lewis Thornton Powell was not born here. He was born in Alabama. I lived in a couple places because his dad was a Baptist minister. Well, uh, by 1859, they had moved to Suwannee County, and he lived just outside of Live Oak, or what would become Live Oak if it wasn't already there. Uh, I've got records in the courthouse showing where his family owned property. When the war begins, he is 17 years old. He joins up with the Hamilton Blues, also called the Jasper Blues, and serves in that infantry unit for a couple of years. Fights in several battles. He's wounded and captured at Gettysburg and uh, is nursed back to health by a female nurse who it seems like maybe falls in love with him and helps him to escape. So he roams around up north a little, for a little bit. Eventually, um, he comes to, to learn about a, a, and meet a famous actor of the day. And this actor helps him out. And Lewis Thorne Powell says, I'll be glad to help you in whatever you need to do. Uh, he's a staunch supporter of the Confederacy. Uh, he joins a guerrilla unit, and he also possibly joins the Secret Service. We don't know. Uh, but anyway, he was a supporter of the Confederacy. So by 1865, this actor is, is working with some other folks to de decide on a plan, uh, perhaps capturing President Lincoln, yeah. to exchange him for Confederate soldiers who are being held in very bad conditions up north in some of their prisoner of war camps. Well, eventually, basically, Lee surrenders, and they decide, let's just kill President Lincoln. So that actor being, of course, John Wilkes Booth, Lewis Thornton Powell is tasked with killing one of the other members of his cabinet because this, this uh, attack on the government is not just President Lincoln. They're wanting to try to get the vice president. They're wanting to get... Uh, Secretary of State, who is William Seward, and whoever they can get that have caused so much damage to the South. So at the same time that John Wilkes Booth is shooting President Lincoln, Lewis Thornton Powell of Live Oak is going in and trying to kill William Seward, the Secretary of State. He wounds him and several other members of the family and friends. William Seward survives because he's already been in a carriage accident, and he's got uh, lots of wrappings and dressings around his neck. So that deflects the knife uh, that he uses to stab him with. Uh, Lewis Thornton Powell escapes. He is captured a couple of days later when he goes back to the house of Mary Surratt, which is where yeah. the conspirators have been meeting. And uh, it's the middle of the night. He says he's there to dig ditches. 
She says, I don't know who this is. One of the guys that's there to arrest Mary Surratt says, I saw that guy at William Stewart's house. And so they arrest him. He is found guilty along with the other conspirators, uh, sentenced by a military tribunal. And then in July of 1865, he is executed along with Mary Surratt and a couple of the others. So uh, meanwhile, his dad, George Powell, George C. Powell, is still here in the Live Oak area, still living here, still performing weddings and such that we have in our records. Uh, he wants to go see his son before his death, but George gets sick and is unable to attend. Um, so Lewis Thorne Powell is executed. His body is buried there in the prison yard. And then after that point, there's some ambiguity as to what happened. Some sources say that he was brought back to the family plot, which by that point they had moved down to Osceola County, Seminole County. Uh, that's where the body was buried. Others say, no, he was just buried in a common grave up in Washington, D.C. But regardless of where most of his body went, his skull was taken from the rest of the body and lost for 130 years or so. Basically in the 1990s, 1994, uh, the Smithsonian Institution, somebody was going through the Native American artifacts and found his skull in those artifacts. So it was returned to the family plot down in Osceola, Seminole County area. But he was from Live Oak. So when you read about the Lincoln conspiracy, you'll read about this young man, Lewis Thornton Powell, uh, who was involved in it, but he was from Live Oak. Good, bad, or indifferent, that's part of our history. Now, going back to the end of the Civil War and, and Northerners moving in, some of those who moved here were John and Nancy partially. Now, as they were moving here, again, Live Oak's growing. These people are coming through to get to the rest of Florida, but a lot of people just say, you know what, this is a nice place. Let's stay here. So by 1866, Live Oak's first post office is established. First postmaster is a guy by the name of Moses Stebbins. Uh, he was from up north. And it was located um, basically the intersection of Howard Street and uh, Houston on First Baptist property now. Let's see. Uh, telegraph lines were established in 1867, so that allowed a lot more, uh, a lot easier transmittal of information. And again, John and Nancy partially have moved here. John moves here in 1866. He is lastly from Ohio but he's also lived in Massachusetts and New York. So he's basically been traveling to different areas. He has gained and lost a fortune or two in timber. And so he moves here. He sees a lot of virgin timber out here in Suwannee County and around Live Oak. So he sets his roots down, builds a home for his family, which his wife and kids arrive 1867, uh, basically. And so they move here. And he starts a sawmill along with some other folks with him and starts laying out downtown Live Oak as we know it today. Because the original downtown Live Oak, when it was first established, was over by Houston Street. The railroad on Houston Street was the original downtown. That's where the original railroad depot was, uh, there um, north of First Baptist, that lot where the Enterprise rental place was. Uh, that was basically where the original depot was located. So that was downtown Live Oak. Well, partially buys property on the east side of that, so he starts laying down streets. That's why we have an Ohio Avenue, because that's where he was from. We've got Wilbur Street, named after one of his sons. Howard Street, named after another son. Parsley Street, named after the family. So that pretty much where the courthouse is today, that area was laid out by John Parsley. Not only that, he built a house across from where the current courthouse is located. A nice two-story building I'll show you in just a minute. It was kind of plain, but it was big and it was nice for the day. Um, but he was, he was big into lots of different things. Unfortunately, he didn't live too long after he moved here. He died in 18, uh, basically 1868 of probably malaria, looks like, from the, the description of it. Um, one of the things he did before he died was he and his wife pushed to have the county seat moved from Houston to Live Oak. Live Oak was more centrally located. It's got those railroad connections north and south, east and west, and it's where he lives. So he wanted the county seat moved close by. And so that was in process. Basically, the state said, all right, 
August 1st, I believe. Um, yeah, August 1st, the county seat was moved to Live Oak. He died August 7th of 1868. So he didn't get to enjoy having the county seat located by his house. One of the other, two of the other things that happened in that same year of 1868, the live oak tree for which live oak had been named, that tree died in 1868. And because the tree died, the pond dried up. No shade over it, plus where they built the railroad, it, the railroad probably flooded the tree so it drowned and died. But then the pond dried up. So you've got all these connections to live oak becoming what it is that die off in the same year. But live oak survives. Nancy Parshley, John's widow, continues to operate the various businesses. She actually, from all the records, she was the, the business person. He, he gained and lost fortunes. Well, he lost fortunes. She gained them, I guess would be a good way to put it. Um, she was a better business person. She was very big into it. Uh, she was able to donate lots of property for schools, for churches, whether they were black and white. She didn't care. She donated to both. Um, a lot of businesses downtown. Uh, she went into business helping to establish a, a school. She was one of the, it was all these men and then her that established one of the schools uh, in Live Oak. It was a private school at that point. Um, let's see, some other things. She's the one that proposed the current location of the courthouse. She proposed that. <clears throat> And it came to be. I'll talk about that in just a minute. This is a, the only picture I've got of the Parsley House. Two-story, pretty plain, judging by uh, the columns and stuff in there. It was it was hurriedly built so the family could move in. It was hot when the John Parsley moved in, and the, the the family was having to live basically underneath the warehouse, the first floor of the warehouse that he had built. So he was kind of in a rush to build a house. So it was very plainly built. It was nice, it was big, but it was pretty plain. But this is it a few decades later. Uh, it was located across the street from the courthouse where the bank is, basically. That was where the Parsley home site was located. It was torn down in 1904, I believe. Yeah, 1904 was torn down, replaced by a building that was called the Parsley Building. The Parsley Building lasted until the late 60s. It was torn down to make way for the current bank. But that was the Parsley House. <clears throat> so, like I was saying a minute ago, Live Oak becomes the county seat on August 1st. This is that act of the Florida legislature that does that. At that time, the state is the one that made the decision to do that. They could decide where it was going to be, and that's where they decided. A lot of it, again, was from John Parsley pushing. He was politicking real hard. Um, our records at the courthouse, lots of good stuff in there. When you have time, come by and look. Most of them are open to the public. But one of the things in there that you find when you start reading through those records is Mr. Parsley had a lot to do with the moving of the county seat. And he had a gentleman's agreement with the clerk of the court at the time. Um, who was Nelson Connor. Nelson Connor was a lot of things. He was a businessman, he was a preacher, but he apparently also was a blackmailer. And that's why I've got records that I've got at the courthouse. Basically, they entered a gentleman's agreement whereby Mr. Parsley would give Nelson Connor several lots in downtown Live Oak in exchange for Nelson Connor getting the county seat moved to Live Oak and then building a courthouse on partially property basically next door to them close to them so what happened was the county seat was moved to live oak in 1868 nelson connor was able to work it out where the county rented the first baptist church which was a block or two away same location it is today and rented that and then a couple years later well, within a couple years he moved it to the partially site to be used as a courthouse well, it didn't last long, it blew down. Mr. Connor apparently did not secure it. So he might have been a good mover, but he was not a good secure of the building. It blew down in a storm. And so basically he comes to Mrs. Parsley. John's already dead. He comes to Mrs. Parsley 
and says, hey, I want the deeds of that property now. I don't want to have to pay this off. I want you to give me the deeds of those properties your husband promised me. Mrs. Parsley says, you didn't do everything we agreed to. You didn't build a courthouse on this property. You moved a building over, but it's gone. You didn't build a courthouse. And so uh, basically Nelson Connor threatens her with blackmail saying, I'm going to get it in the newspapers that y'all helped move the county seat and all the stuff y'all did to get live to become the county seat. And so she, as the record state, tearfully handed over the deeds to the property. And then she went to the courthouse, such as it was, you know, in the rental place they were using, and then sued Mr. Connor. Mr. Connor was clerk of the court. One of the jobs that the clerk of court does, I don't know if you know what all we do, but we do court deeds. We also do court records. So when you come in to sue somebody, you come through the court, uh, the clerk of court. So who is she bringing the documents to to sue? The same guy she's suing. Fortunately for us, he fulfilled his uh, statutory obligations and, and filed the motions and all that stuff. And uh, it went through. He ended up losing, basically, and had to pay her a lot of money. And then he died right afterwards. So it's an interesting story. There's lots more to it. Uh, if you want to come to the courthouse, I can show you some of those records. But anyway, so that was that. Live Oak grows very quickly. Uh, the county's population is growing. And they are adding more and more uh, buildings, such as a jail and stuff. The courthouse selection is a whole other mess. More politicking and all kinds of fun stuff that I don't have too much time to talk about. But basically, there's some entry. There's backstabbing versus that. Uh, illegal activities. Um, involves the partially, partly, but it's not so much their fault this time. Um, interesting. It, it's fun stuff. Basically, Nancy Parsley proposes the site, which is where it is today, in December of 1868 through her son-in-law, who was Mr. Brock. So she proposes that. The county commission accepts that. Well, at their next meeting, she withdraws the proposal. Um, I'm sorry, it was November. In December, she withdraws the proposal. Well, there's another person who wanted to propose it, and that is a guy by the name of uh, Nathan Walker. Nathan Walker was a business associate of John Parshley when they owned the sawmill together. He and Nancy Parshley don't seem to get along very well. Well, Mr. Walker and uh, Mr. Wise, Henry Wise, say, we've got a proposal. We'll build one here about half a mile away on this own lot. And so they start, the, the county commission agrees and says, you start doing it. So he starts building this building. Well, a couple months later, there's an issue because uh, they realize that at that December meeting, they didn't have a qualified quorum of county commissioners. Mm -hmm. They thought they did, but one of the guys had never posted his bond and stuff. So he was disqualified from having been a commissioner. And so at that point, everything they had decided in December was null and void. So at that point, Mrs. Connor and Mrs. Parsley says, I, I unwithdraw my proposal. It's still on the floor. And uh, the county commission likes that idea. But Mr. Walker has already pretty much almost finished his building. It's been a few months. But then not only that, the state legislature, partly because of this issue in Swanee County in January of 1869, said, all right, we're going to let the voters decide mm -hmm. where to have the county seat. And so they have to have an election. So they have their first election in, I believe, March. Let's see, double check. Yeah, March 27th. The results are inconclusive. Um, it looks like Houston, the, at that time the current county seat, just before that, uh, was the winner. They had the most votes. But there was an issue because some people didn't know if they were voting for two sites or three sites because there's discussion of a like a, a live oak site and some other things. Uh, they just weren't even sure how many places they were voting on. Not only that, there were some voter irregularities. You've got people voting twice. You've got dead people voting. So it's not just Chicago and places like that. It happened here. And so basically the county commissioners throw out that first vote they try to put some things in place which stop dead people from voting and people from voting twice. And they have another election a couple months later. And they said it's only the Parsley site or Houston. Those are your two choices. 
not the partially site Houston or what could have been the Walker site. So the polls come out that Live Oak, the partially site, is it. And so partially site becomes the county seat. They agree the deed is, is passed on and the county commission now has the partially property across the street from the partially house. Well, um, Mr. Walker doesn't like that. He's upset about it. He's already spent a lot of money. And uh, he eventually has to start selling off his properties. And then in 1871, uh, he flees in the middle of the night never to return because he owes money to people. Mm. So he fled out west, as he called it, to Chicago, never to return. Well, again, they bought that Baptist church, all these things going on. Lots of stuff about the courthouse because that, that wasn't the end of it. But I know time-wise we need to move on. But eventually, they're able to build this courthouse here. Two-story, wooden building. I still have the original documents at the courthouse. Uh, a guy by the name of Willis Ball who lived in Tallahassee, who was a Civil War veteran. Uh, he built the courthouse, the original courthouse in Live Oak that was purpose-built. Uh, I believe it was eight thousand dollars at the time. Yep, five thousand four hundred square feet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it was completed in the early 1870s, and it lasted until 1903 when they decided we need something bigger and better. So they moved it and built the current courthouse. This is the only picture I've been able to find of that building. This is in the 1960s early, early 70s perhaps. The building was already almost 100 years old. The reference on the back of it says that it was getting re-roofed. Uh, but date-wise and stuff, it looks like they're tearing it down. That's just the first step was tearing the roof off. So uh, it lasted for a long time in a couple different locations. Um, going back to Mr. Walker for a minute. Some of those lands that he basically lost because he owed money on and it was foreclosed upon was uh, his old building that had almost been the courthouse, which had then become a school, that same school that Nancy Parshley had helped to establish. Well, by the 1870s, it is sold to a group of African-American uh, folks who want to build what they call the Florida Bethlehem Baptist Theological Institute. Later, usually called the Florida Institute. Later, it becomes Florida Memorial College, then Florida Memorial University, which it is today down in Miami. But it started out here in Live Oak in 1873. It opened up to students in 1880. And it was here for about 40 years, though, about uh, 60 years. It became a college in 1918. So that was, this probably was that original building that Mr. Walker had built. Don't have any pictures of it, unfortunately. These buildings last until the 1940s. Florida Institute, or the Florida Memorial College moved. They merged with the St. Augustine Bay School and moved. Mm -hmm. And so those buildings that were left behind were then auctioned off uh, by the county because the county decided to put a hospital there. So that was one of the colleges we had here in Live Oak, uh, a black college that we had. That was not the only one then. We also had Brown Theological Seminary. 1870, so before the Florida Institute was established, uh, the AME Church met in Quincy and they decided let's put a school over in Live Oak. Again, centrally located. If you want to go from Georgia into Florida, you had to come through Live Oak. Let's put it there. And so they decided to do it, but then they didn't really do anything with it until the Baptists were building Florida Memorial College and they said, all right, we got to put one in there too. So they built or started building what they call Brown's Theological uh, Seminary. Or uh, Brown's, let me see the title, the long title. Brown's Theological and Classical Institute. So construction began in 1872, I believe. Yeah, 72. Great fanfare. Um, but this institute began construction. It was located, if you want to think about it today, where John Hill Park is. Off Duval Street, it was on the back side of that pretty much. Well, that's where that school was being built. 
1873, there's a financial panic in the, co the entire country. Not a, a Great Depression type thing, but a depression. And so a lot of things have to shut down and stop working. So this school is one of those that is not finished. Plus there are some scandals, there's fires, there's embezzlement, and there's a hurricane. Basically the guy in charge uh, was taking the money instead of paying the workers, he was pocketing the money. So the workers finally got fed up, stopped working, and sued. And so basically they won, and to repay these guys, they had to auction off the incomplete building and tear it down. And there went the end of Brown Theological Seminary before it really started here. A couple years later, they reopened in Jacksonville as Everwaters College. So that Everwaters College started here in Live Oak, technically. Moving ahead, we're definitely going past one. Moving ahead, Live Oak newspapers, various ones over the years. Uh, we've had several by the 1870s, the 1880s, ones like the Live Oak Advertiser, which was bought out by this guy here, Daniel McAlpin, for whom McAlpin is named. We'll talk about him in a few months. Um, he renamed it the Florida Bulletin, and later on it, it became part of what would become the, Florida, the Swanee Democrat, which lasted up until 2020. Uh, so this was one of the predecessors. He was also a uh, state senator for this area. That's this picture. He was on steps of the Capitol. So lots of people moving in. Growth of industry in Live Oak and Suwannee County. Uh, we have a 100% population increase between 1870 and 1880. We double our population here. Lots of storms that hit. Um, so Live Oak is incorporated April 24th, 1878. This is the first page of the city council minutes at the town, town council. And this is the public notice that they posted on March 21st, 1878, and where they posted. And here's all the, the guys we think live in what's going to be the town limits of Live Oak. But they posted in a few different places, and uh, they agreed to meet together. So they incorporate on April 24th. There are 39 men that meet. Women couldn't vote, so who cares if you showed up? You couldn't vote. So it only talks about the men in the minutes. Uh, so they, they meet together. They agree to establish this town called Live Oak. It's one square mile, um, basically. It's 960 acres, I believe. They create the seal, which is a large live oak tree with the word Live Oak Florida underneath it. Um, they create the governor, the, the government. The first mayor is A.L. Woodward. First town council was H.A. Blackburn, H.M. Wood, C.K. Dutton, Major Wise, and Thomas Thompson. S.W. Hicks is the town sheriff and the town tax collector. So they, they agree to that. But then they decide to hold their first official meeting the next day. So they meet and they basically pass five ordinances and go home. One of the ordinances was fining profanity. Another was prohibiting shops and establishments from opening on Sundays. Another was outlawing the parking of mules or horses on the paths or sidewalks. And then uh, the last one was a funny one that I've got a quote of. They punished those who, quote, might needlessly hammer pots at hours when slumber should have been the order of the day. In other words, people making a noise at night. Stop doing that. So they pass those ordinances, and then they go to bed for the night. So that's, the, that's Live Oak established as, or incorporated, I should say. Now I've got a pet peeve. When you drive into Live Oak, you see these nice, beautiful signs. And what does it say? It says, Live Oak established 1878. They're wrong. Incorporated 1878. They didn't consult me before they made them. <laughs> I'm, I'm still upset over that. <laughs> Live Oak had been around for about 20 years by that point. Anyway, as we move ahead, now Live Oak is a town. It continues to grow. In the 1890s and 1900s, Swanee County and Live Oak uh, grow exponentially. Um, lots of folks moving in. Lots of people with money moving in. So you've got places like this. This is Ohio Avenue looking north. And uh, pretty much Pizza Hut is here today, right here. So this gives you an idea. Hardee's is where that house is there. So this was Ohio Avenue. Two and three story houses, both sides. Not just Ohio Avenue, Duval Street was another one. A lot of the major uh, interior streets of Live Oak today 
had beautiful homes like this. Mm -hmm. Lots of people made a lot of money, especially timber, naval stores, those kinds of things. Uh, people like Thomas Dowling. You've got uh, turpentine. You've got shipping on the Suwannee River, brick manufacturing, wholesale, farming, all these Victorian era houses coming up, beautiful homes of which we have so little left of them. Mm -hmm. um, railroads continue to expand. We now have several railroads by this point coming into Live Oak. Not just the major one running east and west, you've got north south running ones. Then you've got short lines running throughout the county that are merging in Live Oak. By 1898, you've got Major Porter, who was from Branford and then Live Oak, originally from Arkansas. Uh, he is leading the state troops, the Suwannee Rifles, which would be the National Guard today, you'd call them, um, during the Spanish American War. You've got Captain Hillman, who who starts out as a penniless boy from Georgia getting off the railroad because he thinks it's going one direction and the train's going the other. So he just hops off at Live Oak, starts working at a local hotel, and then a couple other things. Well, he eventually starts running convicts, uh, or you know, organizing convicts, because Suwannee County had a lot of the state's convicts at that point during that convict labor system. So um, if you've read the book American Siberia, American Siberia, he's mentioned in there a few times. Uh, and this is pretty early on in his career. He is not well thought of by the writer of, of, Swanee, of uh, American Siberia, a guy by the name of Captain Powell. But a few years later, he learns his lessons, and he becomes a, a, a good organizer. He's called captain because he is captain of the convicts by that point, running hundreds of convicts, uh, turpentine, timber, that, railroad building, those kinds of things. So he makes a fortune, uh, lives in Live Oak. He's our first, I guess you could say, millionaire of sorts. <clears throat> makes a lot of money. Major Porter. That's Major Porter in his, what we would call National Guard uniform uh, today. Uh, he basically established our first water, uh, not waterworks, our first power plant here. So lights, we got electricity because of this guy. Uh, he was big into that, plus timber, planing and sawmills, those kinds of things. Lots of things he did. W.J. Hillman, again, he, he arrived here, worked at a few different places, but once he, he got wealthy and established a lot of businesses, uh, he was chairman of the state road department at one point, uh, big into that. He was an original stockholder of the First National Bank of Live Oak, which was a, a cornerstone of the banking industry here for decades. He also helped to organize the Suwannee Hotel, which was our premier hotel in the early 1900s up through, well, it was torn down in the 70s, so between that era, basically, across from the courthouse, that was the place people would go. His house, which was right here, was a showcase. <clears throat> he basically had the story. He, didn't, he and his wife didn't have kids. They were childless. Uh, but basically what they would do is at Christmas, I think the first hundred kids that stopped by, they'd give them a dollar. That was a lot of money back then. He died in uh, 1931. It was a big loss uh, at his death. Mr. Dowling, Thomas Dowling was another gentleman who did a lot to help Live Oak grow. Uh, he was from Hamilton County, but he built Live Oak's first waterworks, originally for himself, uh, privately, and for some other folks, and then he sold it to the city in the early 1900s. He also built this nice home that still exists there on Duval Street. And uh, sawmills, road, uh, railroads, those kinds of things. Uh, Dowling Park is named for he and his, his family who helped establish a railroad line that went out there uh, that was being used to haul timber. Lots of different things. So his house, it's a restaurant still. Yeah, 406, yes. It's the 406. That was the Dowling House he built. Looks like the late 1800s, 1890s or so. And as the story goes, these huge columns were not original. Originally it was uh, like a porch on the top floor and the bottom floor. But his daughter was courting somebody from, I think, Tallahassee. And so he wanted to impress the family. So he replaced them with these huge columns. Looks better that way, to be honest. <laughs> But yeah, the 406 today, good question. So early 1900s, 
Live Oak has grown so much that by 1905, it is the fifth largest city in the state. You've got um, Jacksonville, then Pensacola, then Tampa, then Key West, then Live Oak. We're bigger than Miami, bigger than Orlando, bigger than Tallahassee. We're the largest inland city. All the rest of them are coastal. We're the, our largest inland city in the state of Florida. Now then, population-wise, it wasn't much different than what we've got today. More or less the same amount. Just Miami hadn't grown to millions of people, and all these other places had not grown yet. They kept growing. We didn't, is what happened. But that drew a lot of people into Suwannee County and Delilah. You've got a lot of agencies moving, a lot of, a lot of businesses in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Places like B.W. Helmonston's son in 1892 coming in. Um, first ice plant, 1896. First electric plant built by Mr. Porter in 1901. Um, courthouse, by that point, is no longer working for the county. So they build this nice brick building, 1904, that still exists today. Um, build new post offices. Lots of different stuff. Skimming through my notes. By 1908 or so, a lot of the first generation of buildings, wooden buildings, in Live Oak had been torn down, burned, or replaced, mainly with brick buildings. So this picture was taken between 1897 and 1903. Why do I know that? Well, number one, it's taken from the Dowling Water Tower, which was built in 1897. Number two, the freight depot, which is now the museum, is not here. And I know that was built in 1903. So that's, that narrows it down to about a six-year gap. These were the previous freight and passenger depots. This is Ohio Avenue. This is the, rail, the main railroad that's there today. This is Connor Street. So the courthouse would be over here. It's kind of hard to see. But that's a picture of Live Oak circa 1900. Um, I like the picture. It shows lots of buildings. I mean, these are. this is still here today. That's Love, Inc. This building burned down uh, in the 1920s or 30s. Part of it was rebuilt as a one-story portion. Um, this building here was a hotel for many, many years until it burned down in 1915. Um, let's see. Yeah, but a lot of these buildings here, most of the buildings right here are still there. Downtown Live Oak. So we, we've been lucky on that. Why did so many buildings burn down? Well, for a while they didn't have a fire department. Okay. So it's put out what you can. Plus they didn't have a uh, water system, the water works. Right. It was, you've got an artesian well or whatever's in your attic, dump it out. So it just wasn't enough. Um, the fire department was established, I believe, in 1903, the Live Oak Fire Department, and then they bought the waterworks about the same time. So after that point, it got better. Plus, the city required, if you're going to build in city limits, mm -hmm. it's got to be brick or something. It can't be wood. Mm -hmm. So lots of different things. Probably with some uh, insurance fraud going on, I'm sure, too. And <laughs> I don't like your business, so I'm going to burn it down. That probably was something, too. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, a lot of that kind of stuff. So, city is expanding. By 1907, there's a newspaper article, and it says that uh, all professions were represented in the town, including physicians, surgeons, opticians, uh, oculists, preachers and teachers, attorneys, civil engineers, dentists, veterinary surgeons, and all others that are needed in a wide awake community. Lots of hotels, like the Hotel Ethel, which is that one there. Swanee Hotel was, had just been completed. The Brown House, the Ohio House, lots of boarding houses. They've got miles of sidewalks being poured and going from there. So Live Oak was growing. Live Oak was growing. Now, Live Oak City Hall and government, I already told you about when it was established, not even quite sure where they first held their meetings. The thought is, and apparently it looks like... Uh, at least the first meeting was held at the courthouse, the old courthouse. So that's likely they probably kept meeting there. But for uh, 1886, they began renting a house, or a building, not a house, uh, but a building uh, from John F. White. Now that's what they called the white based and block at the time. It is now where Rip Bullard's office and the public defender's office, those two buildings. 
Those buildings were built in the 1880s, 1884 and 1885. Some of our oldest buildings existing in Live Oak. And so they rented from there. Then a new Masonic temple was built north of the railroad tracks. It was a wooden one originally. And that's where they started meeting. So not only was the town council, city council later on meeting there, but also you've got the Masonics, uh, the Masons meeting there, Masonic Lodge. You've also got it as an armory for the local Swanee Rifles, the, the, the guards. And also a church, I believe, was using it at one point too. Episcopals were using it at one point too. They built this dedicated city hall in 1909. Great building. The guy who designed it, this is the only commercial building that we know of that he built or designed. Young guy, uh, he designed it. It was built solely by local contractors using local materials. It's been around for 115 years plus, so looks like this design was sound. It holds the Chamber of Commerce today. Uh, moving ahead, early 1900s, again, we are growing. In 1909, Live Oak was so prominent that the State Confederate Veterans Convention was held in Live Oak. So this picture is from that. This is the downtown Ohio Avenue and Howard Street running left to right. That's the newly completed City Hall. Um, the courthouse will be about right where I'm standing. This looks like marble. People think it's marble, but it was basically a wooden plaster, a cast built just for this purpose. And once the the convention was over, it was torn down because that was the major thoroughfare. Um, but you've got, you see power lines and telegraph wires. This picture was taken from that white based in block. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this, thousands of people from all over the state and beyond came here to uh, participate in that convention. By 1913, these streets had been bricked or paved mainly bricked, and uh, a sewage system had been introduced. So that helped a lot with all the waste that was still coming from a lot of horses and stuff that would go through. Uh, the 1915, the post office that we had up until a couple years ago was built. Our population in the county was over 20,000. Um, kind of still a wild west. And when you go through our records at the courthouse, uh, you'll find murders, attempted murders, brawls, lots of bigamy for some reason. A lot of bigamy. It's just amazing how many people tried to marry somebody else after they were already married here. I don't know what the deal is. They were like moving from elsewhere. It's like, hey, nobody's going to find out. Let me marry this woman. So you've got that. Uh, another funny thing, um, you see a lot of court cases for women, especially women, who were running what they called, quote, places of ill repute. So... Uh, <clears throat> be the judge of that. They also had a lot of theft of hogs and cows and even sometimes gunfights. There's records of gunfights up into the 1930s and beyond of gunfights downtown Live Oak. So kind of a wild west sometimes. But we were still getting better and growing and all that stuff. Kerry Hardy, Taylor County was where he was born in 1876 and 1900. He moves to Live Oak, goes into law and becomes an attorney but he also gets involved in other things. By 1915, he's elected to the Florida House of Representatives, and he becomes Speaker of the House for two sessions, which at the time was unprecedented. Uh, he later, in 1920, runs and wins governorship of Florida, so he becomes governor, which is why we now have a Hardy County down in South Florida, named after Governor Hardy of Florida, of Live Oak. Uh, his house was across from where Hardy's is. Hardy's, the restaurant, not related to him. People ask me that sometimes. Mm -hmm. Just same last name. Uh, let's see, what did he do? He established the state highway system, historical markers and monuments, uh, knocked out the state income inheritance taxes. Uh, he signed the convict anti-whipping bill. Um, six new counties were formed, including Hardy County. When he retired from politics, he came back home, was in charge of a bunch of banks, uh, got into tobacco, those kinds of things. Um, was involved with the Stephen Foster Memorial over in White Springs, lots of different things. Died in 1957. He was important enough that in 2000, uh, he became one of the, what were they called? 
one of the most important Floridians of the 20th century. And he was from here. He lived here. Moving ahead, 1920s, we see a few things going on. Um, we were one of the largest producers of cotton, peanuts, corn, hogs, and pecans or pecans. Uh, so we were producing a lot of that kind of stuff. Suwannee High School was one of 102 schools that we had in Suwannee County at the time. Lots of one-room schools, but Suwannee High was the biggest school. Began its soccer team in 1922, and we were then state champs that year. Uh, probably because we were the first soccer team in Florida, apparently. I think at the end they had to play the University of Florida because there weren't enough high school teams to play. And I believe we tied. Um, one of the nicknames, you couldn't call them that today, but their nickname was the Fighting Hebrews because there were a lot of Jews that were on the team. But you would recognize some of these people out here. You've got people like the Louis Wadsworth, Alfred T. Air. Um, can't think of anybody else right now, but, but a lot of folks that lived here all their life and were big wigs here in the county and the town. Um, yeah, lots of different stuff going on. 1924, this is Ruby Strickland. She had been the postmistress over in Dowling Park, where she and her family had lived. In 1924, she becomes mayor of Live Oak. That makes her the first female mayor south of the Mason-Dixon line after universal suffrage, which happened in 1919. Now, then, there have been female mayors before in different places, but after universal suffrage, where women got the right to vote all over the country, she was the first female mayor south of the Mason-Dixon line. So she served a couple terms as that. Lived for many, many years, ended up uh, retiring to Dowling Park eventually. And I believe she died over there at the age of like 99 or 100. So uh, she lived a long, full life. She lived on Pine Avenue, she and her husband, who was a doctor. 1930s, we've got uh, a couple things going on. In 1937, this gentleman, much younger at the time, J.L. McMullen, becomes clerk of the court. He was 22, which at the time was the youngest elected official uh, in history at that point. At that point, the voting age was only 21. So he became clerk, my predecessor's boss, um, at the age of 22. Now he told me before he passed on, he was a deputy clerk first. So he worked for the clerk at the time. And he had to get a special dispensation by the governor because he was too young to vote, too young to actually be sworn in as deputy clerk. But the governor gave him a special dispensation so he could work before he was 21 at the clerk's office. Worked there for many years. He then served three or four terms as um, the clerk of the court. <clears throat> Did a lot of other things after that point. Uh, ran several businesses. He was big, He was known as uh, in the Acre Peas, White Acre Peas, that was his thing. He also ran a few car dealerships, different things. Nice man, nice man, lived on Swanee Avenue. Before he passed away, you could probably see him driving around in his motorized wheelchair. I think my dad about hit him because he was out in the road just take it off. But he saw that, that big flag flapping that he had. Um, other things, the jail. A new jail was constructed in 1938 or it started in 1938. And it had a lot of folks in its period, in its, its lifetime, including uh, Ruth McCollum, Ted Bundy, people like that. Let's see, lots of things. 1940s and beyond, you've got a lot of folks that go off to war. Some of them don't, don't come home alive. They are honored by Veterans Park there by the courthouse. Uh, um, Swanee County Hospital. I mentioned it earlier because it was built on the site of the Florida Memorial College. It was built in 1948. It was the first hospital built under what was called the Hill Burton Act of 1948. And that basically gave federal assistance to rural communities. So they could build hospitals, otherwise they couldn't afford. Uh, so it was built there. Anybody born there? I was. I'm the only one here. No, I, I was. You were too, okay. So Holly and I were only. So born there. It was torn down eventually. They got the current one. Um, 1950s. Live Oak was lucky because it had electricity for 50 plus years at that point. 
But it was not until the 1950s that rural communities got electricity and phone service. Live Oak was lucky. Um, the, the Agricultural Coliseum was built. In 1955, you've got the Pineview School being built in that decade. Pineview School, originally elementary school, later became the high school, so it's the current high school today. Uh, you've got WNER founding uh, the Swanee River Jamboree, which was North Florida's largest and best known country music uh, show throughout the 50s and beyond. Lots of country music folks got their start. I don't like country music, so I don't know anybody's names. But um, a lot of folks apparently got their, their start there at that country music show. 1950s, you've got probably our most infamous murder. Uh, in that case is the Ruth McCollum case where she killed uh, Dr. Clifford Leroy Adams. I do a whole presentation on that, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, but basically, uh, she killed him. She was found guilty. But then, uh, by reason of insanity, it was commuted to, her death sentence was commuted to, to time at Chattahoochee at the Mental Institution. And there's, there's a lot of stuff with that. Again, it's a whole, a whole presentation I do on it. There's been lots of books. There's been movies that have been put out on it. I am on the IMDB database, the International Movie Database, because of, of this case. I was in a movie. Uh, they came out on it, documentary. So that's an interesting story. 60s, Hurricane Dora, 1964 hits Swanee County. Live Oak is hard hit. All the flooding you see, downtown Live Oak was flooded. And lots of damage to a lot of buildings. It's bad enough that the governor tours. That's the governor touring. This is a Howard Street right here. They're having to use boats. Uh, this is Mr. Harris, Hal Air's office today law office, but that was a bank at the time. Flooded, lots of damage. President Lyndon Baines Johnson, LBJ, flies over Swanee County and calls the county commission uh, to talk about the disaster that has been created. And up in, that was our worst national disaster up until that point. Unfortunately, it was succeeded by other ones in our lifetime. But Live Oak progressed anyway. This is a photograph from the late 60s, early 70s, showing the courthouse and a lot of buildings, some of which no longer here. That's the Swanee Hotel that's gone. Partially building already been torn down and replaced by the bank. Uh, you've got some of the old, that's uh, the old Seaboard Airline freight depot. Um, yeah, these buildings here burned by fire, arson in the 1990s, are now Millennial Park. Um, the old jail here, the old library, lots of different places. So you can still recognize it. A lot of the same buildings are still there. Ted Bundy paid a visit to Swanee County in 1978, came through Live Oak. Uh, his last victim, 12-year-old Kimberly Leach, was found in Swanee County weeks later. He is found guilty, sentenced to execution. <coughs> And finally, he's executed in 1989. 1980s and the 90s, uh, not so much. I mean, part of it's live oak, part of it's just outside of live oak, but it impacted us. Spirit of the Swanee is established. That brings a lot of business into uh, Swanee County and live oak. It originally was owned by the county. The county, from what I've found in our records, wanted to develop it as basically like a Six Flags on the property, but it never passed. And so eventually they sold it to the Cornette family who established the Spirit of the Swanee. And of course that brings in a lot of people, a lot of businesses, a lot of money to the county and to the city. Um, yeah, that too. Yep, that, that does happen too. Um, our school system, lots of good things going on with that over the years. Swanee High Bulldogs, state champs four years in a row under Coach Mike Pittman. Um, so that was good. The Swanee High Rainbow Team, one more state tournament than the other in the state. Um, that guy might look familiar to you. This is from 1994. I was a little skinnier back then. 